So good morning, everyone. We're going to start this morning's reflection. Uh, we're going to start with a couple of songs, just one straight into the other. Um, so if you want to stay seated, and if you want to either sing along or not, whatever you prefer, basically, the words will hopefully be on the screen. So uh, that's great. i 
prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you that you have brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger. Order us in all our doings and guide us to do always what is righteous in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a collect for last Sunday, the fourth Sunday after Easter. Merciful Father, you gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the Good Shepherd, and in his love for us, to lay down his life and rise again. Keep us always under his protection, and give us grace to follow in his steps. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, welcome again. Uh, we sort of get into the main bit of the reflection. A little bird told me that it's actually Paul's birthday today. So I hope that that's true. So I want to say very, very happy birthday to Paul. I hope he has a very nice day. So the song we just sung, The Day Thou Gave Us Lord Has Ended, talks about the church around the world praying and praising God. And so when we go to sleep, we can't be praying that someone in another country will be waking up and starting their prayer and praise. Therefore, there are always people around the world praising God. It's like we're passing the baton to each other, like this sort of Mexican wave of prayer constantly flowing around the world. I love that image. Um, as the song says, the voice of prayer is never silent, nor dies the strain of praise away. I think this is a really lovely picture of the worldwide church and how we make each other complete as the family of God worshipping Jesus. So we're now going to read a couple of passages from the Bible. Our first passage is from Paul's letter to the Christians in Galatia. Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 26. So, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Our second reading is from John's Gospel, part of Jesus' prayer that he made just before his arrest. He has just prayed for his disciples, and he continues, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Uh, thanks for that. So that, that first passage, the one from Galatians, reminds us that we're all one in Christ. Therefore, our most fundamental identity is not our gender or our nationality or any of those other things that are important to us, but it's that we belong to Christ. 
Whatever differences we might have with other Christians, the most important thing is our joint identity as children of God. And our, our identity of children of God is something that Laura talks about a lot and so how important it is. So this passage from John, the second one, puts is even more strongly showing Jesus' desire for Christians to be united. And the unity he calls for isn't kind of half-hearted unity. It's not just putting up a united front or trying to cooperate when possible. He prays for God that his followers have the same complete unity that he has with the Father. And that's like really complete unity. It shows how seriously Jesus takes his desire for Christians to be united and to work together. And it is a massive challenge to us. <laughs> Church unity can be a difficult topic. Uh, there are sometimes instances of churches where there, there is serious false teaching which we believe is happening, or where we think there's, they're causing harm to others by their behavior. Or there may be abuse or harm being carried out by individuals, which sadly we've heard a lot about in recent years. So church unity shouldn't be used as an excuse to cover this up, which again, it has been in the past. So it's really important not to use that as an excuse. However, in general, Christian unity is something we can all strive for. So what does it mean for us? So there are variations in beliefs of different churches and in the way they do things. However, it is important to consider how important those differences really are. As long as we're united in our belief in the good news of Jesus, we should still be able to work with other churches and share Christian fellowship with them despite our differences. The last year, I visited some friends and went to church with them. Uh, when I arrived at their church, it kind of slowly dawned on me this is a church that used incense and really, really used incense to excess. And I really don't like incense. I just don't like the smell and it can kind of give me headaches. However, the thing is that for other people, incense draws them deeper into worship and they really like it. So it's great that churches exist for those who do like incense and find that helpful. And it's also really great that churches like St. James exist for people like me who don't like incense, but they're just different ways of worshiping. We can be quite quick to dismiss people from other churches who do things differently to us or have different beliefs. Somehow one little difference can make us just dismiss everything about them. But the passages we read challenge us to consider whether these differences are really that important. Should we be making more of an effort to work with other churches as the unified church of Christ? And can we actually learn from practices of other Christians of churches if we really sort of take the time to find out why they're doing those things? This can actually help us to deepen our own faith and to just deepen our understanding of other Christians and where they're coming from. So how can we put Christian unity into practice? Firstly, we can be united as part of the worldwide church. We can pray for Christians around the world, especially those who are being persecuted for their faith. Sometimes there are even opportunities to send support and messages of support and encouragement to other churches in other parts of the world. Some people might get the opportunity to visit them in person. Secondly, we can unite as part of the local church. And there are many ways in which churches in our areas are working together, which is amazing. We've had some joint fund days and prayer initiatives. We've sent out joint publicity leaflets and our birthday boy, family worker Paul, has coordinated some joint youth work uh, and various things like that. And Rev Laura is brilliant at doing this kind of thing, organizing regular get togethers for local clergy, organizing lots of stuff to help the churches coordinate more. Uh, the churches have also been heavily involved with the night shelter and the local food bank. So there's lots of stuff already happening, but so much not only that we can get involved with, there's always more we could do. Thirdly, there's unity and cooperation within our own church. I think people don't always think of that when they think of church unity. But unity doesn't mean agreeing on everything or being clones of each other, which is a good thing. And it certainly doesn't mean that you can't ask questions or debate topics or have different views or styles. However, a church where people don't work together will have much less impact on the community and will just be a less effective witness of Jesus. So at St. James, as in any family or community, we need to find ways to cooperate, to listen to one another and to manage our differences. Unity is also seen in supporting each other's needs. 
So in conclusion, we are part of the worldwide church of Christ and Jesus prayed for his church to be united. We have a challenge to be as united with each other as we can, while still calling out abuse and harm within the church. Our challenge today is to think about how we can be more united ourselves. That might be praying for Christians around the world, a really simple thing we can all do, or getting involved in local events and projects which bring churches together, or looking for ways to work better with each other at St. James's. This could be by trying to be reconciled with someone you've quarreled with or by thinking whether there's someone you can often support or a sympathetic ear to. So it can be just little simple things. So overall, let us grow together as the body of Christ. We'll now move to some prayers. Dear Lord, we pray for the church around the world, especially Christians who are being persecuted or even killed for their faith. Bring them your peace and comfort. We also pray for people around the world who are suffering from violence or conflict, for those placed in the news and for those who feel forgotten. We pray for Ukraine, the Middle East, Sudan and Haiti. We also pray for Mexico, where there's been an increase of cartel-related violence in the run-up to elections in June. We pray for people in our own country who feel forgotten or alone, those without friends, those in prison, those who are being bullied or persecuted by others. Help all of these to feel your love and peace and help us to reach out to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for our neighborhood, for our schools, shops, hospitals, offices, and the streets we live on. We think of all those who live, work, and study in this area. We give thanks for the church families of St. James and Holy Trinity and the other local churches. We pray for the events in the coming weeks, especially our annual meetings in May. With the election of church wardens and PCC members at these meetings, we give thanks for all those who work so hard to sustain the life and work of our churches, both up front and behind the scenes. We pray for the elections tomorrow, for good and wise leaders to be chosen. We pray for all those in our churches who are suffering through ill health, bereavement, breakdown of relationships, loss of work, we especially remember Dan Pinner and David and Christine Mulford following recent bereavements. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now we join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And a final prayer. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw us to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen us in his service. May the joy of the Lord Jesus fill our hearts. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. We will now sing our final song as we are gathered.
Sweet. 